Lamborghini for me has just always been the ultimate supercar. It's the king of the road. What's the most overrated, overhyped, overpriced supercar? Parts that's fitted on an Audi RSQ8 and a Lamborghini Urus. They're exactly the same and literally double the price. Do you think it's a good or a bad time at the moment in the car market? For the buyer, it's an amazing time. For the seller, unfortunately, they are going to be crying right now. David, what's the most expensive car you've ever sold? A Bugatti Veyron 1.2. What is the most nicked car? Range Rovers are off the roof and obviously you can't insure them, insure them no more. Is there any car you would refuse to sell? The McLaren MP412C. If there's ever a car to guarantee you problems, it's that. Who's the biggest supercar dealer, GVE or Tom Hartley? There's not another showroom, independent, that does everything that we do under one roof. David, what is the total stock value of all the cars you have in your showroom? So at any given time, it's between 25 to 30 million pounds. Wow. And are we near a 25 million today or near a 30 million today? I think in today's market, we're near a 30. Reason being, we've just never been so busy with cars coming in into stock. So we do stock. So we stock the showroom in uh, two different ways. Either we'll buy the cars outright or we'll consign them. And in today's market, consigning is really attractive for the consumer. They just want the most money back in the quickest time possible. Um, but if, if I was to buy cars, in the trade at the moment. I'm, I'm having to kick people between the legs because it's such an uncertain market with interest rates going up. The prices have been fluctuating quite a lot. So you're just kind of trying to get the cars into stock. Yeah. George, do you think it's a good or a bad time at the moment in the car market? It depends on who you're asking. I think for the I'm buyer, it's George. <laughs> in terms of the consumer or the seller. So for the buyer, it's an amazing time because you're getting cars for like we were discussing earlier, almost £100,000 cheaper than what they were going for a year ago. For the seller, unfortunately, let's say someone who's bought a G63 for £50,000 over list, they are going to be crying right now in, in today's market because you can now walk into Mercedes and buy a brand new G63 for £10,000 under list. Um, like so, it used to be. Mm. Yeah, like it used to be in the older generation or even when the, the latest generation was just released. So it's... Um, yeah, it really depends on who you're asking, but certain models are still selling for, for um, top money. So SVs were still doing for um, pretty much the same money that we were doing for last year, but it's just that overs market on the new cars, I think, has vanished. Mm. So David, back to you. You said sometimes you buy, sometimes you sell or return. Mm. So is, is there one in here you've bought that's gone? Unfortunately, <laughs> There's been a fair few occasions of that, and that's yeah. the reason why we changed the model up. Um, we bought a P1 back in the day, and you know we we had probably three or four hundred grand's worth of profit in it. Right, and we ended up selling it at maybe a couple of hundred grand loss at the end of it. So that just changed the whole business model down here. Um, yeah, I mean, most recently, I think we've played it really safe. Like I've said, anything that we're buying into stock. Uh, outright, we're really having to play, uh, sorry, play it safe and even kick people between the legs just so that we've got enough margin. So if that car sits in stock for the next three months to four months, we know even if we have to bring it down, we're still going to be sitting in a positive way. Mm. Is, that, um, is that Enzo yours? Uh, that's a long story. And then. Um, uh <laughs> I'm, I'm here for the, the rest world. of the day. So. Um, it's it's a, a bit of a joint venture with a, a, a client what that who's mean? abroad. So uh, initially, you know, he just left it on consignment and now mm. we're kind of partners. Right. Mm. And is it for sale? It potentially is for sale, but for a lot of money, for a heck of a lot of money. How much is a lot of money? George? <laughs> It'd be above three. Yeah. Yeah. Offers over. Offers over, not close to. No, over three. Right. <laughs> so 3.001. Put it this way, when the car came in, it was valued at 1.8 million. And we're now three years down the line. And I think we could easily achieve 3.5 for it. Wow. And when you say a joint venture, are you splitting the profit on the sale? Is that how it works? That would be the way that it works, yeah. Yeah. Creative. Mm. 
I, I think once again in in today's market we have to be innovative and yeah. try and think of different ways to um, get the cars in stuff like this you know mm. um, it's not easy to get somebody to trust in the, in a brand and yeah. put it here does he leave that there just so he doesn't have to store it himself in the winter? Because as you know, I was going to bring my old 911 and the old Testarossa. And I kind of just thought, well, I'll let you try and sell it till March. Mm. And so you can just store it for me. And then if you don't sell them, I'll have them back. Do people just kind of do that? You get some cheeky people that might do that. Because <laughs> uh, it is a fast store in your cars. It's not easy. Um, you need the space. Well, critical charge. That's right. And no then damp. we're coming the insurance. Yes. Um, maintaining, making sure that, that it doesn't go dead during the, the period that it's here. Yeah. And as you can imagine, something like a McLaren going dead, um, the batteries aren't cheap, right? 2,500 or even up to four, four and a half, half grand. Yeah. Four and really? Half grand on a battery. So if it goes dead, you have to replace the battery, do you? If it goes past, it's when it goes past a point of no return, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. Right. Because yeah. every time our Aventador goes dead, all the lights and the electronics reset itself. And, Got to go straight back to Lambda. Yeah, yeah. Well, well sometimes even spikes the system where it will blow one of the control modules or blow fuses and stuff like that. Where we'll have to go back to main dealer get if the car's under warranty, then the car will have to be obviously there. They will replace the control module and whatnot. But if the car w ha does not have warranty, then you're screwed. But yeah. even even yeah. with warranty, and if they uh, certain some, spikes, certain spikes, they don't warranty. They won't well. warranty. Yeah, it. and it's not cheap. Yeah, it's not cheap at all. Bruce, we'll come to you. What's the most popular rap color right now? It's the sparkly stuff. That's that looks genuine. That's what there's certain wants. names. Sparkly pink. <laughs> <laughs> Spark. <laughs> no, you got it right. So, so it, the, it, what, the, what looks a, like pink? Yeah, the, the rap that looks like paint. So we get customers coming in. So look, what is that pink color? Yeah. You know, they don't even realize it's wrapped. Yeah. So those wraps, that's what I fancy. And that's, the, uh, the brand is Inositec. Inositec, that's it. Inositec yeah. brand. Right. The one that looks closest to paint, no orange peel, just like smooth. Straight smooth, yeah. yeah. And, and is the colour of your Urus a popular rap colour at the moment? Well, we had Matt Watson the other day down here, and what did he say? It looks like poo. Uh... It looks like poo. <laughs> <laughs> but he also said he likes it. Yeah, you yeah. called it sound <laughs> I we were on sound. the phone, yeah. Somebody called, I mean, somebody called it caramel, like latte, a latte colour. And then, yeah, I've just had all sorts of stuff um so what drugs were you on when you decided <laughs> on your rap <laughs> so it was actually quite funny because i went abroad and before going abroad i said to george do whatever you want to this car i'm going to leave it with you <laughs> Look at no, do you know what i want i wanted to do something different but i i but said to go for that color poo dip poo sounds different <laughs> well, no, i i wanted to wrap the car a different color but david said he liked that color before going so i don't mind that I said, I don't mind, but just do anything that you think is better. Did, yeah. did I, didn't I say that? You did say that, but then as soon as you came back and the car got unveiled, within two seconds, you're like, no, change that. Take that off. Yeah, yeah the yeah, white yeah. strips. <laughs> you didn't like the white strips on the guy. <laughs> so do you really like the colour? Look, um, that car is essentially a marketing tool, right? So we're getting, uh, we're, we're putting a Quicksilver exhaust on it yeah. in the next couple of weeks. We've got, got a, 10, uh, a 1016 body kit on it. We've got okay. a Brixton forged um, alloys on it. So it's just a walking bill, I mean, sorry, a driving billboard for the company, right? And everything yeah. that we can do. So if we just went for a, a satin black wrap or if we went for something, you know, really safe, it just wouldn't have the same effect. Whereas that, if I drive down the street, there's people breaking their necks just to look at that, uh, you know, doing double takes and whatnot. Whereas a black normal Urus, just don't, it looks like an Audi from afar, right? Yeah, well, like an RSQ8. It's funny you say that, because <laughs> I actually wanted to ask Bruce this. Uh -huh. So, because um, Bruce, I've seen you do all your yeah. Lamborghini Urus videos. You can't tell me that it's worth paying 200 grand more for an Urus than my Lamborghini Urus, which is just there, yeah, my RSQ8. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you so, pay 200 grand more? Well, I paid 105. Okay. The thing is that, that me personally, I'll get an RSQ8, right? Personally, I'll get an RSQ8. But, <laughs> You're um, gonna come to me, <laughs> in a minute. No, obviously, because I work with cars all day long, right? The parts that's fitted on an Audi R8, sorry, RSQ8, and a, uh, um, 
Lamborghini. Euro, Lamborghini Euros. They're exactly the same. On the Euros, they will have a Lamborghini badge on their stamp on there and literally double the price. It's only just for the badge. Just for the badge. Are they interchangeable, the parts? So could yes, you, of you, course. Are you, you able you to can use the RSQ8? Yes, a? of course you can. You can take it from an RSQ8, take that part off, fit it straight on the engine, engine will work perfectly fine. Wow. Exactly the same. So what are you paying How does that for? make you feel having an Urus? Uh, You're paying ecstatic. for the badge. <laughs> yeah. 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 The it's, it's like a watch. Huh? Yeah. There, it's not just I, the I've badge. got a C code that can <laughs> do exactly the same thing. Could, the same as Richard Mille. Uh, yeah. Can it? <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> <laughs> I've got a finger that can do it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, go on. You know the um, Urus. So is it essentially the same engine as well? It's the same engine, I don't think. Uh, the tune is slightly different. It's more horsepower on the, mm. um, on the uh, uh, Urus. But, but doesn't uh, the RSQ8 go around the Nuremberg ring faster than the Urus? No way. I think it does. I think if you look, it the does. fastest 4x4 around the Nuremberg ring is the RSQ8. What? Yes, Can I just say one thing though? <laughs> you, you buy you buy a luxury car, a supercar, to not only make yourself feel good, but when you drive around, you like the looks, you like the attention that it gets. And if from I have my a Lamborghini invented off of that, why would that you want not to convenient. put in super... You may want some passengers in the car. You may yeah, but the RSQ8 is more convenient than the Lamborghini Urus, isn't it? Not necessarily. No. Well, it's not going to go wrong as easily, is it, Bruce? Which one's going to go wrong more? The <laughs> really, true. The they both go wrong because they, they they share the same sort of parts, all right. But obviously, with the Lamborghini, it will cost you more because exactly like what I said, Lamborghini badge. Um, but obviously, what looks better? Well, the my wife thinks the RSQ8. Looks no, better. I think Lamborghini looks amazing. The yeah, the Urus. The Urus. Yeah, they look just. I think it's subjective. As a machine. Your missus no, no, probably I, likes to I be... Think it's, I think my opinion is right. <laughs> Sorry, <go on. laughs> what, what were you going to say? No, I was saying, you're probably, the people who probably like to be under the radar and don't want to be spotted, then they'll go for an RSQ8. Mm. The people who want to constantly be loud and would have an Aventador as their fun car and then have a Urus as their daily, that's the perfect car for them. I mean, yeah. that, that luxury SUV market right now, there's only the luxury performance SUV market. There's only a couple of cars to choose from. The Urus, now the Pura Sangue, the DBX is up there, but I personally don't think it's in the same league or the same bracket as a Urus or a Pura Sangue. What about the Cayenne Turbo S? The Cayenne Turbo GT is one of the quickest ones out there. But mm. when you look at it, people who don't really know about cars would still look at a Urus and say that's surely more valuable than a Cayenne Turbo GT without knowing that the Cayenne Turbo GT is the fastest production SUV mm. model ever built. And the problem with those are the fact that the uh, Turbo GT looks exactly the same as a car from like four years ago or five like years a ago, S, yeah. like a Cayenne S, which is going to be what, 50 grand, 40 grand. Yeah, that's the thing, like that. they won't know the difference. Yeah, so it's people's perceptions and how, how that makes you feel, right? Mm. How does it make it, you feel when you're driving your RSQ8? I think it's the most amazing car. Yeah. Um, that's the Vorsprung. And I've never had a car with the most outrageous tech on it. Really? It's, they just, the Vorsprung, you probably know, but the Vorsprung is like, oh, that's every extra. Yeah. Don't mess around. That's every extra. And I have, Harry drives it. I have never seen so much tech in a car. Harry in, fact, just said, in fact, that Vorsprung will have more tech in than your Urus. Yeah, 100%. Harry just said behind the camera, buy a Urus. No, you didn't. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> you did not. <laughs> yeah. But by all means, like, what I'm trying to say is that if you have the money to buy a Lamborghini Urus, buy it. But and that's did. why we but have But I feel TV. like I saved 200 grand. 100%, but that's what we have. I can place spend like. it with you on another car. <laughs> Firstly, cool. someone's overcharging you for that Urus. It shouldn't be above 300. I think when I got the RSQ8, hmm. I think the Urus, it might have been the or as performante. Uh, Might have been, but there was, there was definitely um, an Urus, what, 350 yeah, grand? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. the path. Yeah. Then in that scenario, the performante is a much better car. No! Nah. Oh, <laughs> I don't know, just talking from a, from a sales perspective, I think an Urus performante, do you have that much exposed carbon on an Urus Q8 four sprung? Do you have stiffer suspension? There's different components, right? The RSQ8 sharing the air suspension from an ordinary Urus. Yeah. The Urus Performante is now on springs. Yeah, on springs, on so lowering springs. Yeah. Yeah. Different oh, engine mapping, different gearbox mapping. Different maps mapping. and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. 
Puff Monte is an amazing car to drive. But, but okay, here's the thing. Um, a lot of people get fooled into thinking, oh, well, I've just saved a whole load of money in going for something which is, you know, like an RSQA or whatever, right? But what they don't realize is an RSQ8 is a mass produced car versus something like a, a Eurus Perf, which is not a mass produced car. Now, whilst you're paying more for it on the front end, if you look at what the Eurus prices has done, have done over the last few years, it's unbelievable that you're still having to pay close to list. Am I right? Yeah. Close to list price for a used Eurus from what year? Let's say 2019 is still going for very close to list with reasonable mileage on it. Value and retention now, on the Eurus. Do you now, think if you go risk? back to an RSQ8 from yeah. 2019, with the same kind of mileage, yeah. if you look at the percentage depreciation, so that's pretty much zero depreciation, and this would be what, 50% at least by now? 40%? Yeah, 30 to 40%, 40%. on a 19, yeah. Because list price was a lot lower back then as well on the RSQ8. Do you think there's a risk, though, that as soon as you buy that, it could just go... If it was a untested model um, and there was a bit of a risk behind it, like people were thinking when the Euros was just released, mm. yes, it's risky, but it's, it's a successful model. People mm. want to, your footballers are buying them, your um, mothers who want something flashy for the school runs are buying them. It, there's a market across the globe for the Euros. And on the back of that, Ferrari have gone, no, it's not a four by four, but they've gone and released this super practical, this thing. Four seater. Yeah. They don't want to call it an SUV. They don't want to call it a four by four. So it's something to rival the Eurus, but they've done it because of how successful the Eurus was. I mean, the Hurricane was one of the best selling models Lamborghini produced until the Eurus came out. And that, yeah, that it's... car, from a sales perspective, once again, if we could fill the showroom up with the Euruses, we would. Wow. Okay. So everyone watching and listening, get in the comments and tell us if you like the RSQ8 or. Pay an extra 200 grand for the Eurus. Let's see what everyone thinks. I, I was open minded, by the way, for you to all talk me into the Eurus, mm. but you failed. <laughs> <laughs> but again, if you're buying a Eurus, right, if you do have any issues on the car, you can come to us. Yes. That's why we're here. I'll get, I'll get authorization from you if I'm allowed to put TPS, Audi, Volkswagen parts on there, which is going to be the exact same parts. You, will, you literally spend half of the money. On the car, where if you there go you to go. Lamborghini Urus, and so you, you get, you're fixing it for the same money as, as a, an RSQ8, uh, uh, oh. RSQ8, oh. and oh. you're losing, oh. uh, you're, uh, <laughs> you're losing less you money on it. You should be the salesman, because <laughs> <laughs> I work on them all day long, and then I yeah. always speak to the customer. Look, this part is 600 pounds from Lamborghini, and I've just called up TPS, and it's 180 quid. What do you want to do? And they always give me the authorization to get it from TPS. Yeah. So, you know, save And, a and of by money. the way, it's not 200 grand extra. If you're, if you're not going for a pair, it's only 100 grand extra, right? I, th I paid, like I said, just over 100 for that. So you can get an so you, for just uh, over used, 200. Well, used. Yeah, one. that was a year, year old. Okay, yeah. So it'll be 100 grand extra, right? Yeah. Well, we've got Eurus starting from just 180. Right. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he's changed his mind. <laughs> no, I was just allowing you to have your moment. <laughs> <laughs> and so, a modification that yours just have, I can fit it on your um, Audi RS Q8 as well. My wife would be really happy with that. Anything you want for the exhaust system and like that, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get that sorted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, George. Yes. How old is your youngest client that's ever come in here? We had a Porsche Carrera GT, um, and I got a phone call from what sounded like a very young chap. And he said he wanted to come down and view the car. And I said, okay, that's fine, not an issue. Initially, you're thinking, okay, this guy's probably gonna be a time waster or he may just be coming down to take some pictures. But never judge a book by its cover. You have to take them seriously. You never know what it's gonna lead to. Anyways, a couple of days later, he turned up and was looking around the car. He didn't seem older than 15 years old, I'd say. Wow. wow. Um, looking around the car and then he was with his father um long story short three or four days later the car was paid for in full and um he's bought it and then the father said to me on the day of collection he said it's really refreshing to see how you treated my son i didn't have the time 
to call around and try and find this car. And I saw this popped up. My son showed me and he said, he'll take over the negotiation. He'll take over um, the inquiry stage. And uh, yeah, at 15 years old, he managed to buy his dad in a million pound Carrera GT. There is another one that springs to mind as well, actually, is uh, only, I think he was a 14 year old, a 14 year old Brazilian. He came down to view a Veyron. He didn't buy it, but he was serious and he was showing me his collection. So you have a lot of um, younger, younger people buying cars on behalf of their family. Rob.team is my digital financial freedom platform where you can learn, earn, invest, start and scale a business and make, manage and multiply money. There are hundreds of hours of courses, resources, masterclasses you can join right now. It's all on the other side. I'll see you there. David, yeah. has anyone come and just brought a bag of cash and just bought a car with a bag of cash? No, uh, the, 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 those days are quite long gone now. And I think um, there's been people in the past that have picked up the phone and asked the question, but we just kind You of just can't? Can't. No. What's the most overrated, overhyped, overpriced supercar? I would say the Lamborghini Revuelta in the moment. For a car that's not a limited edition, track-focused version, um, it's a normal standard production car to be listing at above half a million pounds before options is insane. And I think that is overpriced to another level. I know it's a replacement for one of Lamborghini's most successful flagship V12 cars, but that sort of money at list price before they've released a Super Veloce version of it or any other track focused version, that is, that, that is the car that hits the, the nail on the head. It is overhyped. It's probably going to be an amazing car, but it's definitely overpriced. So I'll, I'll have the pro saying, right? Look, 400 grand. Again, it's the basic version of the car. This is before they release any special track focused edition or whatever. And I'm guessing is that that's not a fully spec'd car. So you, you go and put You can go, yeah, you can go ridiculous. You can go a half a million. Atelier, yeah, yeah, above yeah. half a million. I just don't see it. And look, this is us scratching our heads that perhaps this is inflation. Perhaps these prices are here to stay. But once again, at some point, people are going to be like, one second, we. The finance rates have gone up so high, we can't afford these finance rates. What's the point? I'd much rather stick my money into something else. Uh, and then, actually, are the residuals right? Are these cars going to retain their value or are they just going to dump you know, in the year's time? Because what, what the, the market of the last two, three years has been a little bit spoiled. They've not seen the whole thing that we've seen back in the past of you buy a supercar, you expect to lose money on it. You drive it, you expect to lose money on it. Everybody over the last few years has bought a car expecting to make money on it after driving it. Well, I don't know how long that market is here to stay for. But anyway. mm. what, what would be good for you to comment on is from the mechanical side of things. Yeah. When you look at it and you open that car apart and you think, is that it? Is that all it is? Yeah. Bugatti? Or... Yeah, Bugatti, Bugatti, Bugatti. All right, let's talk about Bugatti. Um, when you look at a Bugatti, it's like, wow, Bugatti. At the moment you take the back end off, everything is VW Audi. Again, when I look at the parts and it's like, okay, let me ex explain about this, the Bugatti we had here. I went on the track and whatnot. When it came in with the uh, launch, the launch control, you know, messed up the car and when it dropped the power, dropped it, went into a safe mode. When it came down and when I checked it out, um, had some earth issues and uh, air mass sensors. So I thought, let me just find out how much the, the air, air mass sensors from Bugatti is each. They're four air mass sensors. One air mass sensor was 4,700 quid for one. One sensor. One sensor. I looked at the part number. It was the Bosch part number. I checked it out with VW. It was a VW GTI, yeah? Golf GTI air mass sensor, which is about 120 quid each. So then look at it. Is that not overpriced? <laughs> Here we go. Bugatti is, is literally overpriced. And a lot of the parts that's on the car, it's a lot of it is Audi Volkswagen, Audi Volkswagen. And again, Bugatti are charging extortion amount of uh, money for parts and labor. It just doesn't make sense. So is this why Bugattis have dropped when people thought they would go up because of the mass parts and servicing costs? I think so, but he's the right man to ask. You're, you're spot on with that. I think the maintenance cost is 
or everyone's number one negative opinion of that, that car because it was every boyhood's dream to, to have a Bugatti Veyron. It was that flagship car, the first car that's gone above a thousand brake horsepower, the first car that cost above a million pounds. There's like everyone's thinking this is the dream to own one. However, when you come to reality, there's quicker cars out there that you can get for a fraction of the cost. Like, um, well, I mean, it's something like a 720S in a straight line is quicker and you can pick one of those up for 130 grand. Um, there's so many cars. Most modern day supercars are quicker than a Veyron. But if you still want to buy one for your collection, you're looking at annual servicing costs of roughly 20 to 30,000 pounds. You're looking at the change of tires every three or four years, which will set you back 40,000 pounds. Your wheels having to change those every five or six years um, because of the speed ratings that the manufacturer's guidance is saying you have to change them. Um, once again, again to 60 or 70,000 pounds. So the maintenance cost of that for someone who wants to buy a car as a collector and leave it parked in his garage is then taking away any profitability that they would make by selling that car in years to come. So I think long term, yes, they will be going up, but the maintenance costs of it do kill it, do kill that, that dream of having that in the collection. But could you do what Bruce suggested, which is have the Bugatti and then get the parts from VW? 100%. And I think now... Exact same part number. There is no badge. There is no badge. Bugatti is thick as nothing. It just says Bosch and Bosch part number. That's all. With two screws. I think you can get the exact same parts from TPS. Exact same parts. So it's, it's a no-brainer, right? Is that <coughs> not going to issue... Is that not going to cause an issue with your stamp though? That's, that's what I was about to say, that yeah. the market now needs to catch up and know that Bugatti can't have this monopoly on the market anymore. If they're charging ridiculous prices, you speak to anyone out there who actually uses their Veyron, or their, well, let's focus on the Veyron because that's where the pricing's stupid, they won't take their car to Bugatti for every small issue because it's, why should they have the monopoly? Now, if the market now realizes that you don't need that Bugatti stamp on the service book, there's specialists out there, who can work on Veyron's just as good as Bugatti can for a cheaper price, then it won't affect the resale value. And I think once that message gets passed into the, um, into the supercar or hypercar buyers community, then the market will change. And we've seen that already with the likes of older Ferraris. You don't have to get a main dealer history with them. Some people actually prefer for it to go to a specialist because yeah. they look at yeah. it better than, mm. than a main dealer would. So they, they got away with charging that kind of money for ages because well not got away with it but the reason their rationale was that the amount of R&D that went into making the Bugatti Veyron actually when they did first start selling these things they were at like half a million quid loss on every single car they were selling uh, VW were back in the day yeah so they tried to recoup those recoup losses from yeah so even like the, is it Michelin tyres yeah that? They're the only ones who can make them to glue them to the alloys. And... We had a rep come from uh, Michelin um, to the Goodwood stand that we'd done a few years ago. And I was asking him, like, is it justified? You know, the 40 grand uh, price on your tyres, is that justified? He goes, trust me, they're not buying uh, them 40 grand from us. As I go on, they tell us, he goes, no, I've got an NDA, <laughs> but I promise you, they're making shit loads of money on that. Wow. Mm. David, what's the most expensive car you've ever sold? Um, it would be a, what would be a, a toss up between a Bugatti Veyron. At the, it was the red one, wasn't it? Black and red one, yeah. Black and red one, which was around how much? 1.2 1. 1. at the time. 1.2 and then a P1 for 1.4. Which is better, the Bugatti Veyron or the McLaren P1? In terms of profitability. Um, In terms of the car. Oh, what do I think is better? Yeah. Oh, 100% uh, uh, Bugatti Veyron. I, I think it's a work of art, even though everything that we're saying and all of the yeah, maintenance yeah, yeah. costs and this, that and the other, you know, uh, we, we've seen it on the m much uh, higher end of the market with these Ferrari 250s and whatnot going for crazy money. And then there's no ceiling in terms of what they're going for. And so that resembles the art world, right? So the Picassos are going to go for God knows how many hundreds of millions now in the future because, you know, there's more of a demand for them, right? Well, eventually, once the demand for uh, Bugatti Veyron does catch on, then actually the kind of people that are going to be buying these things aren't really going to give a crap about 
uh, how much servicing is going to cost because relative to the amount that they're going to pay for it and where they think that it's going to go to in the future i think um yeah i, I think these things are going to become really valuable as are la ferraris and whatnot mm. but I, I think look ferraris and bugattis are, are it's a brand that's been going for so long right and it has established that um history of of appreciating assets but mclaren's just a little bit it's a little bit behind in the game, but they're probably catching up now. George, Dave Ramsey, big American money guy, says you should never get a car for a loan and always buy a car only when you can afford it. What are your thoughts? I think that's very old school mentality. What I am thinking is put yourself in a buyer's shoe who has a lot of liquid cash sitting in their account. Now, the interest rates in today's market, yes, granted, may be a bit expensive in comparison to what they were a few years ago. But let's say the most competitive rates right now are probably about 9.9%. Are you telling me that you can't make your money work harder for you uh, at a rate or make your money earn you more than 9.9% per annum? Well, I think people are earning that in a month on a certain trades. So why would you not invest your money elsewhere to earn money um, as opposed to have it sat there in an asset that you're just going to be using and driving um, and it's doing nothing for you? So use, uh, I mean, for example, um, what's that guy's name? He done Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Robert Kiyosaki. Robert yeah. Kiyosaki. He done an interview. Yeah, he was on two weeks ago. Oh, really? That's yeah. so cool, by the way. Mm. Yeah. His number one thing is use other people's money to make yourself rich. So use someone else's money to fund the car that you want for your own lifestyle so that you can actually use your liquid money to go and make money from it. Don't put your money in an asset that you're going to be driving and enjoying and a depreciating asset that you won't be able to then invest and make money on but um that's my opinion of it anyways uh, can i just add one more thing to that is the fact that um there's some people out there that you know are rich on paper their balance sheet is good right but liquid cash they don't have a lot of money because it's tied up in properties this that, and the other right so without them financing it they wouldn't be able to but they've got pl plenty of monthly income coming in so that's one number two is then there's the person that actually isn't that rich and is okay his credit score is okay and is able to fund this car and he's just got lucky porsche just turned turn around and told him look you can get a gt3 rs so now he can go and buy that car on a finance deal drive it for the next 12 months put a heck of a lot of mileage on it and still come out having made a profit on top of the finance uh, fees that he's been charged. No brainer. So that spins off two questions. I'll go with you, David. Is it actually possible now to get a GT3 RS? Aren't they like hen's teeth? Well, um, George and I had a meeting the other day about one of my friends once, and um, they've come down in premium so much. Like they were probably 200 grand at the start when they did come out. And now they're, they're more, more like, you know, 90 to 100 grand premium on, on a GTP RS. George, did I hear you talk about how many Porsches you might have to buy before you can get a nice GT3 RS? I don't think that's the case for everyone out there. But there was a client of mine who said um, he had to, his dealer told him, uh, you have to go and buy eight to 10 cars before we will allow you to spec your GT3 RS. Um, he got to his eighth or, or well, I think he got to his seventh or eighth car. And then he said, okay, surely now I can lock my spec in. And the dealer principal of that certain Porsche dealership said to him, I'm, I'm really sorry, I can't guarantee you the slot. And that's after he's gone and spent money on buying eight models that he didn't necessarily want just for him to go and get the GT3 RS. He then walked in here and, um, off the whim, hated Porsche altogether, ended up buying a 488 Pista. And that's when he told me that story. And he's like, I just, I will never touch another Porsche in my life. And I would never speak to another main dealer in my life. Um, wow. Yeah. So um, that's probably, though, why the premium's high, I guess, on the used ones. Yes, yeah, it's, it's virtually impossible for anyone, no matter who you are, to walk into a dealership and say, I want a GT3 RS. Um, that's for the UK market. However, I'm through the power of social media. I'm hearing it's different in America. There are some slots available. Um, but in the UK, 
is sold. Like it's completely sold out. You can't get a GT3 RS. And I'm sure there's some very wealthy people out there who still want one to add to their collection and they will spend whatever money they have to spend to get one. Mm. For us as a used dealer, we love it. It's, it's God. Like, yeah, music yeah. to our ears. George, is it true that you can get someone a Rolls Royce for £1,500 a month? Very true, yeah. I mean, there's a couple of... How can you do that? Well, it depends on what sort of deposit you're putting down. It depends on which Rolls Royce we're talking about. But let's say something like a Series 1 Wraith you can pick up for £100,000. On top of my head, um, I would say for a £100,000 Wraith, which will have a fairly good residual, you could pop down a £10,000 deposit and easily get away with payments, roughly £1,500 a month. Wow. I wonder what Dave Ramsey thinks of that. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce. What is the most nicked car? Range Rovers. End of? Nothing comes close? Well, the thing is that the higher amount is at the, the, the top right now is Range Rovers. I would say second, Ferraris. Range Rovers are off the roof. and Obviously, you can't insure them, insure them no more. People don't want to buy them. Reason you why. can't insure a Range Rover? You can't. In, yeah, well, no. you can. Yeah, but the point is that... <clears throat> In London, can you insure a Range Rover? Well, look, let's say you live in Chelsea, Kensington or whatever, right? And you park your car on the main road, which a lot of people have to do um, uh, when, they're, when they're living in town. You're getting uh, insurance companies either refusing to insure or they're putting up the prices so high that it makes it virtually impossible to insure. So I've got my, one of my best mates that lives in Marlebone went on holiday with his family, car gets nicked, he lives in the same block as Madonna, and his, his car gets nicked, and comes back, tries to get another Range Rover, they've put it up to something stupid, like 25,000 pounds in a year, just for his insurance premium, and he's just turned around and said, sod it, I'll just buy a BMW now. Bruce, why are Range Rovers so easy to nick? It's the way they've built it and stuff. You know, there's a bypass, um, it's a few wires, you can join in the back and it starts the, the car. It bypasses the mobilizer and starts the car. And, so you can uh, basically just hotwire it. So there's, they will cut um, a square hole in the back, a little hole, put their hand in, join three wires together, and it literally starts the car. Ignition on, you can just jump in, press the brake, start, boom, it starts. Um, that and the keys are not highly secured where someone can just walk past you and, and catch the, the code key code and literally make a key with their computer and open the key with their laptop sort of thing and um yeah it's just the design is you know they, they need to improve on their immobilizing system and this will stop this from happening but i, I think they didn't think this through right mm. where you know car could get stolen and whatnot but now they you know people are selling a lot of these uh, trackers and this that and other there are some good trackers i've heard a lot of good stories about you know the tracker called tracker because there's, uh, I forgot the name. They can track what? The trackers? Well, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the block VHF. 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 Yeah. VHF. So VHF, VHF uh, system cannot be blocked. So a lot of these times when they steal those cars, they will put a blocker in, uh, a blocker in the middle, which will block all the um, yeah, signal. signals. And um, yeah, the VHF uh, cannot be um, blocked. Stands again, for very high frequency, right? Yeah. And even if you disconnect the battery for four hours, it's still active. You can't, you know, within the four hours, you know, before you even search for the car, police will find it anyway. Right. Yeah. And why are Ferraris so much stolen? Again, they can be bypassed, the keyless entries, and uh, the key codes can be literally scanned off your house. They can literally go around with the little satellite uh, across your house, and they can catch the, the signal and code a key again and put a blocker on the center of the car and steal the car. You know, the common thing you're saying is like these, um, it's, it's all with these keyless start things, right? That's yeah, 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 yeah. So do these blockers actually work? Like where you put your key in a metal pouch? Is that, is that actually something that would work? Would you recommend that? There's a lot of advertising uh, out there that, you know, for blocking the signals and stuff like that. But the people, there are people still finding a way to catch the signal. So say like if someone's watching where you live and whatnot, and you've just pulled your car a key or a key out, 
off your mm. pouch a few times. And then they they would just it. wait around yeah. your house and exactly. they would eventually get the code and then come when the call. Well, I've got that Faraday box, mm. they call it, and my wife never bloody puts the key yeah. in. <laughs> and I keep telling her, and she just leaves it next to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The same problem. But you know, um, <laughs> the other thing is, I've, I've actually heard of a, somebody getting their car nicked because they advertise their car privately on Auto Trader. Somebody's called up, I'd like to come see your car. When they've come down, they've copied the key oh, in that yeah. whole process, then gone off. Then later on that day, yeah. just come back and nick the car. They've, they've done that a lot of Auto Trader and Pissing Heads. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's actually quite clever, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Hence why people need to sell through us, right? That's oh, exactly man. what I was going to yeah. say. <laughs> 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 just give it to a trader and let, deal with it. <laughs> mm. George, first, then David. Is there any car you would refuse to sell? <laughs> I think this is a common theme across all supercar dealers, but I'm pretty sure David would say the same thing. But McLaren MP412C, that's something we just wouldn't touch at the moment. They are, if there's ever a car to guarantee you problems, it's that. Why? Yes, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> oh, you had a 12C? No, we, when we, before we bought one of our Ferraris, we test drove the, that McLaren, which I've, I found soulless. I didn't know, really? it, I didn't know that it was... This quick and nightmare. Yeah. That's the annoying thing, though, because they're, they're amazing cars to drive. I mean, when you think about it, when the really? 12C... You couldn't really... The sound wasn't there. There was no excitement or soul in it. Did you switch it into the track yeah. right there? I'm sure Mark did when it was his go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, when you stick it into track mode, then it livens up a little bit. But I kept, like, if I was to compare the MP4 between the um, Huracan and the 458, I'd, it's definitely those two over that. Ferrari started copying what McLaren did in 2010 with the 12C on the 488. So I always think that McLaren are decades ahead in terms of... Um, but they did it worse. <laughs> Oh, They're, yeah, they, they were just too ahead of themselves. Yeah. They, they released it too early, and I think they didn't do enough research into issues that could flag up. Um, there was constantly uh, recalls coming on the car. They were doing uh, upgraded generations of batteries, and it was just like constant spend for the customer and, unfortunately, for the selling dealer as well. If 12C was the, you know, that, that was them pioneering a different type of supercar and there was stuff bound to go wrong, and then progressively, cars have started to get better and better and better. And now this 765 um, LT Spider, that was like all the critics were like, this is one of the best cars ever made, ever. Is it? Well, I, I never drove it, but. Yeah, I think right now, for what, what else can you pick up for that sort of money? So for 400,000 pounds, you can buy yourself a lovely LT Spider. In that bracket, you may be able to get an SF90 Coupe Yes, the SF90 is very quick, but it doesn't give you that drama and that engagement that an LT will. I mean, the LT, with it being a long tail, is focused on being that track-focused McLaren. Everything about it is you can hear the stones flicking up on the underside. You can feel how lightweight it is, how darty it is with the steering wheel, how rock-solid the suspension is. The, the pace from 0 to 60, the acceleration on that is unreal, unlike anything else that I've seen. Even with hybrid power on the SF90, the 765 LT is hands down one of the quickest cars out there. But it's just one point I wanted to touch on what David was saying was, had McLaren spent long enough to research on their model, they would have, they would have released an amazing car because they used the same chassis, the same engine, the same gearbox from the 12C to then go to the 650. The 650, the issues cut down a bit, but they were still there. They then went to the 675 LT and that, to date, people are still saying he's one of the best McLarens ever built, the 675LT. And that's after they've had eight or nine years, let's, let's say six, six years on practicing on that same chassis, that same engine, that same gearbox, and they've just made it the best version they can of that. And they produce an amazing product. I, I don't think you'll hear one bad thing mentioned about 675LT, unless you're speaking to David about how much he sold his for, but yes. Yeah. How much did you sell yours for? No, well, we, we bought three McLarens in one go, expecting to make a lot of money out of them. And two of them were 
six seven uh the, one was a six seven five lt coupe six seven five lt spider and one was a p1 obviously i mentioned that we made a big loss on a p1 but on the, the other two yeah I, I reckon it was like 75 grand on each one we lost nightmare nightmare but look that again would you pick a different car than the mclaren for a car you'd never sell no 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 painful mm. it's been painful having to see the comebacks on those 12 c's and the 650s mm. you know when and this is the part and parcel of running a business like this you have to expect this is a machine with hundreds if not thousands of moving parts that at any point you could have checked it as much as you want to and look to be honest we're we're, we're unique as far as supercar dealers go in that we've got one of the biggest supercar independent supercar service centers so we're checking the cars thoroughly before we sell these things right but those damn things just no matter what happened no matter how much you check they go wrong and then when they go wrong they come back and then you have to do whatever it takes to try and fix that car mm. so you don't have it returned and you have to fork out a whole load of money it's so bad that i won't disclose this and, and put this dealer under shame but mclaren themselves have sent us an email for a 12 seat that sat there saying our head technician head mclaren technician has come down and we're flabbergasted we just don't know what's wrong with it we don't know what the issue is um we're going to need another week to try and figure it out it I you think about ones. It's you're probably talking about the same thing, but the, this 12C was produced in 2010. We're now in 2023. It's 13 years for them to know this car inside out. And still today, this only happened a week ago, they were saying everything's fine on the car. It's running fine. We just have no clue why this fault's flagging up. But we absolutely have no clue. We're waiting for the factory to let us know. Bruce, if you had your way, what car would you never touch mechanically, an absolute dog, and you would say to George and David, do not sell this? You know what? I'll touch anything. I'll fix, I'll fix anything. You anything. mean I'll fix anything? No, I'll touch <laughs> anything. Sorry, Don't sorry. slip that. There's always, there's always this subject. <laughs> oh, do you see it like a challenge? I yeah. see it as a challenge, and I don't let anything down. Anything comes through that door, anything supercar, that's a problem, I'll deal with it. I'll find a way. You know, it, so you it, want the worst one? Sorry, you want the worst Sometimes, one? Sometimes, yes. Fix I think it. it activates your brain, sort of thing, keeps your brain going. Yeah, and you just grow, grow, grow stronger and stronger. And I love new learning, new stuff. So I'm always finding a way. And before I find a way, I would study the fault first. I'll study where it's coming from, why, and what. And then I go into the sensors. What do the sensors do and whatnot? And then I would find exactly where the fault is. Like he was talking about, there was a McLaren 12C that uh, uh, main dealer had quoted that we had sold to a customer main dealer had quoted for an oil pump and and they said they said potentially engine failure and the car came back obviously they were quoting stupid money i can't remember how much it was and came the car came to us and then i was like hold on a minute let me just start the car because i you know oil oil was fine and whatnot i just wanted to check the oil pressure start the car up and then manually i was reading through the diagnostics machine the oil pressure was fine but it was uh, flagging up on the uh, instrument cluster, engine failure, oil pressure, engine failure, oil pressure. All right, turned it off. And first things first, don't overthink. Go to the simplest thing first, simplest subject, simplest problem first. So I went into checking the oil pressure sensor on the 12 Cs. And what they have done is, it's like there's like a hole and the sensor literally sits two inches down. And what happens is when it rains, it will get flooded. It will fill up with water, and then when you start the car up, it will start boiling. When it starts boiling, it will, it will bust the seals in the sensor. The plug's got a little uh, rubber seal in it, and the rubber seal will get bust, and the water will go, go inside and fuse the sensor, which will cause an oil pressure fault. So then um, I contacted McLaren again. I said, listen, the car's got water damage uh, on the sensor. All it needs is a sensor, and you guys need to upgrade the sensor. And they said, oh, what are you talking about? Who are you to tell me to, you know, what to do? I said, all right, that's fine. So hang up, whatnot. And then we had a lawyer dealing with this issue, uh, independent lawyer. Um, and yeah, he was a half technician as well. And he said, Bruce, I want you there. So we went to Shrewsbury and checked it out. And the master tech was working on, on that McLaren. He, said, he goes, listen, there is no water damage. Like another. And I showed him. I said, look, look, it's submerged down. The sensor, why is it sitting submerged down? And I said, hold on a minute, let's go to a 720. 
McLaren 720, they had it there. I said, go and have a look at that sensor. You guys have upgraded it. You've put a block there to lift the sensor up so the water doesn't go in there. So it's a factory failure. This is why the sensor had gone wrong. And he looked at it and goes, oh, yeah. So he didn't realize himself. You know? I, think, I think the thing that you guys need to understand about Bruce, I think he's getting a flavor. He's, <laughs> he's, um, a, he's one of a dying breed of uh, technicians that don't have to rely on plugging a car into a computer and computer says, change this part. So, and you and, like stroke the car like a horse yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you turn it on. <laughs> Supercar whisperer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Supercar whisperer. That should be your new podcast. Yeah. Supercar whisperer. <laughs> Do you think it's easier to sell 10 Fords or one Bugatti? Each cell is the same as another. There, there's no one cell that's harder than another. You may come across a more difficult customer, but. Um, the most important thing is, you know, the product. Um, and you attend to the customer how you should with any car. If we're selling a, a £10,000 car in comparison to a £2 million car, the service won't be any different. It's, it's the representation of our company. And if one customer walks in and buys a £20,000 car, one day going forward, he will be a customer to buy a million pound car. And that's, I think that's how we have to look at every deal. Mark and I were having a look round, and we just can't get over these square, not even square, rectangular, hexagonal, weird rear Ferrari lights, which to me have absolutely ruined what a Ferrari looks like. And at the back of some of these lovely Ferraris, I love Ferraris. We had the 430, the 458, I got the Testarossa, but I'm looking at a Chevrolet. What are your thoughts? Mine? Yeah. Um, I, I found the similarities between the SF90 and the 296 um, a little bit weird in the sense that you're paying half a million pounds for one and then what, 300 for another? Is that that kind of difference? Yeah, price well, difference? you can get 296 now for 230. 230 to half the price, yet they kind of look so similar. The yeah. performance of the 296 is so great, right? Um, which is which is a bit weird because normally um, the the change in the look of a Ferrari between each iteration is so much that you know you can't. Uh, whereas like something like a Porsche, you can't tell. Mm. Very, um, it's not very apparent. But I I quite like the design of the new Ferraris. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I always look at it from a value perspective. You know, does it look different enough to justify spending another 250? And like, I don't think it does. Mm. And what do you think about the look? I think the, the major thing over here is the loss of Pinaparina. That, that elegant, beautiful, natural designer Ferrari that any supercar collector is used to, unfortunately, has now parted ways with Ferrari. It's never going to be there. Um, but then you go back and you look at the likes of the Testarossa in comparison. Let's say the 512TR has then changed from the 550 to the 575. The differences in those, in those models were pretty drastic. And then to the 509 and then to the F12. So yes, when you see change straight away, it may not look good. But over time, I think it will grow. Um, and unfortunately, the S, I say unfortunately because I, I'd like to say I'll stick to my word, but the SF90 was a car. I didn't think I'd really like, but I'm, it's actually really growing on me now. I do right. think they're beautiful. Mm. It's this whole modern era that I think all supercar brands are trying to do. And then I'm going to sound like a McLaren fanboy because I keep saying this, but McLaren were the first ones to go for this modern look with the 720S. And I think when, when that got released, everyone was like, that is a hideous car. And now it's grown on everyone. Mm. You've got Ferrari doing the same now with the 296s and the SF90s and um, Porsche almost adapted their looks with the Taycan. Now the Mission X is coming out as well next year. That's once again, very, very modern looking car. So I think we have to count our blessings and say we're very lucky to be going through this transformation of supercars to see them from what they have been like for the past 50 or 60 years to now see the future of what they're going to be like going forward. 
David, can you make money investing in cars anymore or have we just missed the best time? I think it's probably the best time. Really? 100%. Um, Haven't there a lot of how, just how, what, What's the fastest you can sell? Uh, so what's the fastest amount of time that you can sell a property in? Oh, realistically, three months. Okay. So now... Maybe Mark could do it quicker with some cash. <laughs> um, with a supercar, it can be... Well, I'll give an example. We had an SVJ that just came... Uh, uh, into stock on a Friday, and by the Monday it was sold. And you money know, in the bank, money well, a deposit in the bank, but yeah, yet, yet to complete. But we've got commitment now, yeah. right? Uh, invoice signed, uh, deposit in, yeah. And that's a what 400 and something odd grand deal. That where else, other than like watches and whatnot, what, where else can you have? those kind of value of deals getting done in that short amount of time, mm. number one. Number two, a uh, year and a half ago, this was a seller's market. You would go up to somebody selling their SVJ and you'd be saying, hey, come on, um, give us a deal. And he'd be like, piss off. You know how many other people that have asked me for, your, for this car? Forget it, I'm, I'm not giving you a single penny off. And now those same people, you're going up to them and saying, you, you want to sell your car, do you? All right. Well, I'll give you 50 grand less than you're asking for or whatever. So I think that's the key difference right now. That there's a lot more negotiation out there. Uh, people have got their renewals coming up on their finance deals. They're realizing, damn, you know, my finance monthly repayments are going to go up by 100% as a bare minimum. Um, so I should probably get out of this car, given that my mortgage has gone up this, that, and the other. Luxury things are the first things to go. Now, the thing is, on the, on the other side, you've got the buyers that weren't buying two years ago. The guys with liquid cash, they've been sitting on the sidelines, they're waiting for the right time to strike, and now's the right time. George, what's a car that you think is a really good investment, but it's undervalued or people don't know that this is a good investment? In today's market, a 458 Speciale, I think, is fairly undervalued. Uh, was it 400 and something, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, we just saw it. Yeah, that's yeah. an under 1,000 mile car. It? It's I'm, what? That's, it's only done 800 miles. It's under right. 1,000. So you think over 400 Speciale? Wow. Hold me to this, and I'm, I would put a bet down on this, but in 10 years' time, a Speciale would be over a million pounds. So you wouldn't even it's, go for the piece, do you? Just the Speciale? Yeah, it's a collector's car. It's the last ever naturally aspirated V8 mid-engined Ferrari produced. Now, for you to say you've got that very last track-focused naturally aspirated V8 based on an engine that's won the best ever Ferrari and uh, best ever engine made award um, based on one of the most popular selling Ferrari models, it's giving you 250 GTO vibes. It, it is going to be that ultimate Ferrari collector's piece. And I think right now is very undervalued. That's Mark's wedding ring. <laughs> <laughs> because, he's, because he's just bought the special <laughs> yeah, yeah, He's just swapped his wife in for it. <laughs> 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 you have to leave that bit in, Harry. <laughs> Every board meeting that goes, ding, 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 ding. ding. <laughs> is it because you're always taking it off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had the 458 and therefore the, you know, in the thought process was maybe we should just get the Speciale and mm. obviously we didn't. Do it before it's too mm. late. Every year that goes by, people are saying the same thing. A year ago, that car would have been just over 300 and the year before that it would have been just under 300. Um, we sold a 458 Speciale about three years ago now. Um, for 200, about 260,000. That same car is on the market today at 360. With an extra 5,000 miles. Mm. There's David. no replacement for it. So. Wow, yeah. Mm. David, what do you think is the most undervalued car that might be a good investment right now? I'm, I, I know we've talked about this uh, before, but I still think it's the Bugatti Veyron. I really do. I think that that car, you know, just like George is saying that the, the 458 Speciale is going to uh, maybe hit a million pounds in the next decade. 
I reckon the Bugatti Veyron will probably hit 10 million in the next decade. And, you know, somebody counter me, counter that argument. Servicing. No, why? Like, again, it's, it's going to be... Bosh. <laughs> you've got GPE now. you've got supercar Bruce I I think I think the Veyron is going to be a good investment going forward because to say you hold on to a piece of history the first car that's beat a thousand brake horsepower the first a million pound hypercar ever built naturally any collector is going to want to have that mm. um, and then you go back to What's the old Bugatti? The EC EC one or something. I think they call it the old classic Bugattis. Those are trading for about fifteen million pounds. Mm. So eventually, I think they are going to have to follow and catch up. And the Chiron is mass produced in comparison to the Veyron. There's so many Chirons out there. How many uh, Veyrons are made? They're not numbered, but on top of my head, I think there's only about three or four thousand worldwide. That's including all of their special edition models and everything. Yeah. Mm. Does it have to be a supercar? No. no. Okay, okay, okay. I've, I've got an R33 GTR, and the way the engineering on that car, yeah, it's Mercedes are now doing it on the AMGs, and even the Urus is doing it, and then the back rear end steering and stuff like that. The GT, uh, even R32s, they had rear end steerings, but obviously they now they do a cancelling um, bar and everything. But it's, I just, I'm just thinking, you know. 10 years down the 20 years down the line, you will not be able to find those cars. Obviously, they rot. It's a Japanese car. But as long as you look after them, you know, uh, uh, get anti-corrosion stuff on it and stuff like that. <sighs> I don't know how, they, how much they're going to be valued at, but definitely over 150 grand. And how much are they now? Right now, it's around about 40 to 50,000 pounds. Do you know when the new GTR is coming out? I had the 34, I loved it. Um, when's the new one coming out? I'm not too sure, you know. I haven't done my researches. I haven't done Because I've been waiting for that forever. Yeah. They're talking about it. They haven't released a date, but they are no, talking about it. But they've been talking about it for years. I think they're still trying to milk the, um, the current generation. So they just released the latest Nismo they've in Japan. They've done it again. Uh, exactly. The yeah. facelifted, the facelift, yeah. the facelift. But it's such a successful model for them. They've sold well, so of many. It is. I mean, they've taken the piss now, though. Yeah. But they're still selling. I had yeah. a guy demanding the latest facelift Nismo. And then I was looking at the pricing, the facelift Nismo in comparison to the previous generation Nismo of that same, the R35. Um, Sorry, it was the 35 I had, not the 34. Yeah, I was thinking you that. Knew that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the price difference was like 30 grand. I paid 35 grand for my 35. Yeah. I think it's the perfect project car you can get. Yeah, perfect you get people who want to work on their cars. Mm. And just I stupid can't amount think, of horsepower yeah. on that car, yeah. Yeah. It's a safe car to work on. Yeah, definitely, yeah. As well, you can load it to 700 and not ruin it like you could another car. You can load yeah. it to yeah. 1500 and we'll still be happy to sell it. It's, it's a bullet <laughs> Wow. David, tell us something about car dealership that car dealership won't tell you. It's a very hard business to be in. It's very enjoyable. You get to work with a, a beautiful product that excites everybody. But um, a lot of people don't see the daily um, trials and tribulations that you have with uh, selling a supercar. Yeah, I think the day-to-day -day, day -day runnings of a dealership are obviously hidden behind the glorified world of social media. So everyone gets to see the glitz and the glamour of living with supercars and everyone saying it must be amazing to be able to drive these cars and deal with these cars. But unfortunately, there is always going to be a downside and a negative side to anything positive, but it just comes down to the point of, do you love cars enough to go through that? And um, the answer is yes. So, so my friend went viral because he walked into Ferrari dressed in a tracksuit and they ignored him. And he actually ended up getting a Lamborghini out of it when he went to Lamborghini and told him there was this big viral PR campaign that happened about it. What's your view and experience on dealership experience and how people are treated when they go to buy cars and if it's changed and if it's good enough? We'll go with you, George, first. 
It's funny you say that. A uh, recollection of a customer who walked in with sandals, socks, and his toes sticking out of his sock, <laughs> holes in his t-shirt, um, food spilt down his top, and almost like the vision you have if someone were to say a tramp, that you think this is what that guy looked like. Sounds like me on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> he walked in and he was just like looking around all the cars, didn't make an appointment. Um, but I have this rule that never judge a book by its cover. You never know what would happen. So just give, give your time to him and just answer the questions. And you obviously filter them to see if they actually know what they're talking about. And he knew about cars. He said he had some cars in the past. So yes, he passed that, that initial quiz of if he's a buyer or not. Um, long story short, a couple of hours later, he walked out of here at the time a £200,000 F12, which he paid for up front there and then. So. Um, Never judge a book by its cover is, is my point. Mm. So we'll start with you, Bruce. Rank these in order. Lambo, Ferrari, Porsche, McLaren. Rank them one to four. Porsche number one. Lamborghini number two. Ferrari number three. McLaren number four. Why Porsche number one? Why McLaren number four? Engineering is amazing. The engines and the way it's built and everything is serviceable. Everything is accessible and everything is made in order to work on. It's not so, like a McLaren. It's not designed to work on. It's, most of the time you have to, you know, drop engines or you have to like, um, strip half the chassis apart to get into the stuff. If, if the car had a crash front end, you know, you, when you start taking stuff off the, the way they've rooted the pipes, it's like a one hole pipe that goes to the back of the engine and stuff like that. You can't mount it off the front so you have to restrip the back up to to in order to uh, strip something out in the front it just doesn't make sense at all so that and the way they drive the way they pick up the way the engine sounds the way it idles perfect Porsche it's just engineering is amazing in the mechanical side of view I'm saying and should we talk about number two Lamborghini yeah. <laughs> again Lamborghini Je, um, Aventador's Obviously, a lot of a lot of it is Italian, uh, but um, they're again serviceable. You can work on them, and parts-wise as well, German parts, and it's got some German engineering as well. Interior, taking dashboards out, uh, repairing um, what else? Repairing suspensions and springs and stuff like that. It's, everything is accessible, doable, and stuff like that. Fourth one, Ferrari. Ferrari is the third one. Third one. Sorry, third one, it's Ferrari. No, what's, the, what's going on with the numbers today? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ferrari is um, a bit of a, you can't get your hands into it. Like the manifold sticks on the top of the engine, you can't, it's you know, hard to get to spark plugs. You have to lean over the, the quarter panel and stuff like that. And um, the way the engine sits in the back, it's not designed to be worked on, basically. That and McLaren, same thing. McLaren. So McLaren was the last one. That's yeah. right, yeah. So the McLaren, um, the design is crap. But the drive is amazing. The drive on the McLaren is fantastic. Uh, the way the engine picks up. I think they just mainly are, are concentrated on the performance of the engine and gearbox and the suspension. But mechanical-wise, um, there's a lot of t uh, hours, labor time involved in replacing small, small parts on the engine. Whereas, as, as in for a... Um, uh, a Porsche, pretty straightforward. No stuff that you know. They're even dropping the engine out is pretty easy. It's designed to be stripped easy. You know that you don't need special tools and stuff like that. From McLarens, a lot of it needs special, even to fit a crank seal on it. A special bra bracing and crazy stuff. Where I made my own stuff here, but yeah, um, yeah, that's it. There's a lot of stuff in both, but I just need to keep thinking about. It. I can go on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my, my justification is different to Bruce's, but I'd, I'd go number one, Ferrari, number two, Lamborghini, number three, Porsche, and then number four, McLaren. Um, Ferrari is just because of provenance. The, the whole history of Ferrari, you know you're buying into a brand that's established, that isn't, you know, going to not buy their cars back from you as well, which is something that we've seen happen with McLaren before in the past, that 
you know, there was a long stretch of time, and probably still now, even today, they will not buy an MP4 12 seat back off of you or a 650S. So, how explain that one to me, right? Whereas the likes of Ferrari, Lamborghini, and Porsche do, They're, they've never had a problem in buying their own cars back. Um, Lamborghini would come second because <clears throat> it's just the best looking uh, uh, supercar out there. You know, it is that I've just made it supercar. And um, and actually, as time's gone on, they, they have uh, become easier to maintain and parts have become more accessible as they've been making them more mass produced. So, you know, when we when we used to work on stuff like Gardos before, it used to be a nightmare because you'd have to wait for a few weeks, maybe if not months, to get parts in on Gardos, where, whereas Hurricanes, when they go wrong, uh, you can get them very quickly. And I guess that's the sharing of parts with Audi and whatnot that yeah, made them a lot right. more accessible. Then Porsche. Porsche is just pound for pound the 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 best car out there, right? But my only gripe with Porsche is the fact that you've just gone and spent 170 odd grand, 180 on a Turbo S. Yep. Yeah. That's that's supercar money. Now you're definitely gonna get supercar performance, but you're not gonna get supercar looks. And so if you're spending that kind of money, surely your part of it is that you're you're wanting other people to also know that you've just spent that kind of money. But my my main gripe with Porsche is that the hundred and eighty thousand pound Turbo S looks a lot like the hundred thousand pounds nine nine one Turbo S, uh, and you know people don't know that you've spent the extra eighty. And then mm. finally, McLaren. I love McLaren. Uh, you know, it's probably for the last seven years, it's probably been our best seller. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm. Um, but just for all the reasons that we, we've mentioned before, that if, if, the own, if, if the manufacturer doesn't have enough trust in its own products, then how can anybody else? And mm. I, I suppose I'm, I'm a little bit biased there because of the amount of comebacks we've had with McLaren's. Mm. I'd go Lambo, Ferrari, McLaren, and Porsche because A, I'm a flash bastard, <laughs> that I buy a supercar because I'd want to be seen and heard. So unfortunately, that is why Porsche is the lowest on, on the list. It is, in my personal opinion, I think it's either a track car or it's a sports car. It's not a supercar. Um, it doesn't quite, like David said, it doesn't give you the looks of a supercar. Lamborghini, for me, has just always been the ultimate supercar it's the king of the road an aventador till now i would say is still the king of the road a ferrari has the provenance you drive into the into mayfair and you see a ferrari and anyone of the age of three years old would know that's a ferrari that's got that much history behind the brand and mclaren is it looks and sounds and drives crazy enough for it to be deemed as a, a supercar so someone will look at that and be like wow amazing piece of engineering it looks amazing um, and then lastly, Porsche, it's an amazing car to drive, brilliant car to live with. Um, one of the best performing GT cars out there as well, but it doesn't quite give you that satisfaction of I've got a supercar. And I think if you are spending the best part of two or 300,000 pounds, you want to feel like you're driving something special. And unfortunately, a, a Turbo S or even a GT3 or even a GT3 RS to that extent doesn't make you as special as something like an event for SVJ would. Maybe GT3 RS, no? It, on the track, it will feel special. But on the road, I think an SVJ alongside a GT3 RS is, for me anyways, it's You had SVJ your chance. <laughs> <laughs> you had your chance. <laughs> George, as a top supercar salesman, how do you sell anything to anyone? It's not about selling them the product. It's about reading the person and seeing what they want. Don't try and force sell them something. Help them. You want to be that person that they can rely on. So you're not just selling them one product now and wave goodbye and never see them again. You're building a relationship with them for life. So if you come to me today, Rob, and you say, I want a GT car that uh, I've got a certain budget with, I'm not sure what I want, I'd suggest you a right car that would hold its value correctly with the right specification that we'd buy that car back off you, to which then, you would want to buy your next car off me. So um, yeah, 
it, it's not about force selling something to someone. It's about reading that person and seeing what suits them best and what would bring that person back to you when they want to sell that car and buy another. Mm. And, and David, I wonder if you could make this official. Um, who's the biggest supercar dealer, GVE or Tom Hartley? <laughs> oh, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question now. Uh, look, I think uh, we're very modest about what we've achieved here. Um, and we have a very, very different setup to the Hartleys, as, as you've mentioned, or to any other supercar dealership. How's it different? Well, that's a very good question, Rob. I was just coming on. To that. <laughs> OK, so initially we started off in export. Um, and then when Thailand, the, the government was overthrown down there, then that market died a death. So then it was like, OK, let's start something in the UK. And how can we control our demand, right? Whereas in Thailand, if it goes off, it goes off. So then we started off with a little showroom, 14 car showroom, start selling. And once it got to 10 cars in a month, we realized, OK, this is going good. We need a bigger place. But what we realized during that whole period was, OK, when a Ferrari goes wrong, if we're having to rely on Ferrari to fix this, we're not going to be in business for very long because these cars keep on going wrong and they keep on trying to charge us a lot of money. So we started our own service, car, uh, service center. Then we realized that each one of these cars that we're bringing to stock needed some form of paintwork in order to make it look brand new. And then uh, opened up our own, our own body shop. And then it was like, okay, now we, we started our own PPF center, our own detailing center, our own wrapping center. And so, and now uh, just recently opened our own MOT bay. Um, so we are the most complete showroom in the UK. There's not another showroom independent that does everything that we do under one roof. So we've got 45,000 square foot uh, uh, and, and we're doing everything under that one roof. So uh, uh, along with that, we've got around 55 to 60 employees at any given time. So when we're comparing us to the likes of Hartleys, it's it is very hard to compare on a like-for-like -like basis. We're not the same. Um, but what I'd say is, look, we get around 120 leads to 130 leads a week. And that is because of our social media presence and because of the amount of effort that all of us have put into this. Um, I don't think there's another dealership getting, another supercar dealership that's getting that level of leads. And that could be leads um, with people wanting to sell their cars to us or people wanting to buy cars from us and whatnot. Uh, so, uh, and then in terms of how, w where we're going, we want to, we, we're, we're currently like 130 cars in stock yeah. at any given time, 130 to 140 cars at any given time in stock. We want to take that to 300 cars. So if we were to, able to get 300 supercars in stock at any given time, we'd become not just the biggest in the UK, it would become the biggest in Europe. And I don't know, there might be some bigger places in the world. But, you know, that, that's the aim. That's what we're shooting for. But yeah, we don't really look at other competitors down here in the UK and say we need to compete against them. We're just kind of staying in our own lane, trying to compete against ourselves. Is the diplomatic art. <laughs> <laughs> I think beneath what your words was also the answer we were looking for. Yeah. <laughs> um, George, would you rather have one million cash on the table, tax free, it's yours, take it, or one million engaged social media followers and why? Mm, I'd go with one million engaged social media followers. So I think the value you can have on the back of social media could produce you a lot more than one million pounds. So it's investing in future profits as opposed to just walking away with some cash that you're going to burn and uh, eventually have nothing left with. I'd rather have a little more followers uh, so I can help them out. So if they get stuck with cars, where they get ripped off and stuff like that, and I just want to help them out and say, look, you can actually get it done cheaper. This is the process. Don't just listen to someone and just spend thousands of pounds that you've saved most of your life or you worked hard on. I'd rather get it fixed cheaper and you're happy. But you could buy the speciale over there and still have 600 grand in the pocket. You know what? My rule is money comes and goes. 
money can always come, but help and knowledge you can't pay for. So sharing that out is the biggest thing. You can't you can't spend millions and in, in, in gain knowledge just like that and experience, can you? <laughs> David, this is the final question. This show is called Disruptors. What does the word disruptive mean to you? Disruptive means to me, um, you know, going ag against what you're being told is the norm and, and you know, having the confidence and, and the willpower to go and do that. And what I'd say is that we've definitely been disruptors in this industry uh, over the last decade. I think when you look at the, our social media or look at the people that work here, we're a young company. If you look at the median age of the people that work here versus the median age of, a, of another supercar dealership, you're going to find that we're very young uh, in comparison. And, you know, I would think that a lot of people out there thought, well, one second, how are these guys going to do it? You know, there's no way this thing going to last for very long or this that, and the other. And we've proved them wrong. So I reckon we disrupted the supercar industry. George, these four investments, you're allowed to pick two and then rank them one and two. Gold, property, watches, cars and why? <clears throat> number one will be gold and number two is cars. Number one, gold, because that's the oldest form of currency. Um, it's something that's continuously been growing in, um, in value. So it's probably the safest option out there. Number two, cars. I know the car market better than any other market out there. So if I were to back myself in what market I could go into and um, multiply whatever investment is in there, it's going to have to be cars. I'd certainly go for cars number one. And the reason why is because um, in, especially in a market like today, I think that I, I have enough knowledge to know if I can get that car, that car's going to double or even triple over the next five years. Know it already because they're never making that car again. And the, you know, the governments turned around and said in 2040, no more, you know, petrol engines or whatever. So we know that it's, uh, limited supply, never being made again. I know for a fact that that car is going to go up in value at some point. Whereas something like gold, what if a mine is dug up in the next year that produces more gold than anybody's ever seen before? Suddenly the price is going to tank, right? Surely it has to. Uh, and then number two would be property, in my view. Again, similar concept to. Uh, um, the cars, but if you're able to afford places in Mayfair or, uh, you know, the top spots in the world, then you know that in Mayfair, there's only a, a small block of land that there's no more space to build any more properties. So it has to carry on going up at some point with the obvious dips in between. David, George, Bruce, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for having me at your you. showroom. Yeah. Thanks for teasing me with all your cars. <laughs> Although I spent all my money at Carl. <laughs> oh, what a low blow. <laughs>